We all, at some point or another, have been absorbed by photographs from the past. There's something about the grainy faces looking back at you from a picture taken 120 years ago. Every single person in the photograph may have passed on, but you still have a glimpse into their world. I think we also have a perception that the camera never lies, or at least it's a more truthful representation of the past than, say, a diary or written account from the time. Now, there's no doubt written accounts from the past present a biased view of things, but a few weeks ago I visited the Irish Photographic Archive to make this episode on the history of photography in Ireland, and it certainly changed my mind about photographs. Now, there are millions of images in the National Photographic Archive. After finishing the episode, I learned two things that this episode is based around. One, that photography is way older than I thought, but also that the history of photography is a history of manipulating the past. I was surprised at the extent of editing, basically a 19th century equivalent of photoshopping, that went on since photography first emerged. This podcast explores not only the history of photography, but also the murky history of image manipulation. Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dwyer. Now in today's show, we'll be meeting the archivist Nora Thornton to head behind the scenes in the National Photographic Archive. Nora spends her days cataloguing and analysing the millions of photographs in their collections. And in this show, she'll be taking us back to the dawn of modern photography in the 1830s, nearly 200 years ago. Before we join Nora in the archive, just two things I want to mention. Next week's show is an interview with Dr Eileen Murphy on groundbreaking new research on medieval life in Ireland. So from the toothaches that killed to the bizarre rituals performed after death, that episode will reveal what it was actually like to live and die in Ireland in the Middle Ages. That's all coming next week. Meanwhile, today's show, as I mentioned, was recorded in the National Photographic Archive on Meeting House Square in Temple Bar. It's well worth a visit. They always have great exhibitions on display. They also have thousands of images online. You can check them out at the link in the show notes below. We actually discuss a few of the images in the episode and I have those numbered in the show notes and I'll mention them as they come up. Sound was by Kate Dunley. Nora and myself had a pretty wide-ranging conversation about the history of photography in Ireland. It's not something I would have known much about, but if pressed, I would have said I thought it emerged in the 1860s. But Nora began the story of photography centuries earlier with something called the Camera Obscura that had been in use in Europe since the Middle Ages. Now this camera did not create a photo as we understand it, but it could project onto a surface This obviously wasn't a fixed image insofar as it was only a projection. It couldn't be saved, for example. Although people did sometimes trace over the projection to create a permanent image. While it's not quite photography, it is an important starting point. Nora explains a bit of this history now. So I suppose the camera obscura was probably the first version of what we call a camera. It basically just shone an image through a tiny little hole onto a background and then that became, it couldn't be fixed, so the image could be traced. It would be upside down. They've been around since the 1100s. But people would have to actually draw in the exactly, image. Exactly, exactly. Okay. They wouldn't okay. have, it wouldn't have been fixed onto a, you know, a, a print or whatever. Yeah. That came a bit later. Now, the first photograph, or rather an image that looks like modern photography, was developed in the 1830s. It was called the daguerreotype. Nora showed me one of these. I've linked it in the show notes below. You can check it out there. But they were, as you're about to hear, created on a mirrored surface. But the image itself was as lifelike as any photograph from the 19th or 20th century. But it's nearly 180 years old, far older than anything I would have expected to see when I was visiting the archive. As Nora takes up the story, she mentions something called a direct positive image here. That just means that the camera created the picture you look at, meaning daguerreotype pictures were one of a kind. You couldn't replicate them. That is kind of important. As we will hear, 
This would change later in the 19th century with the development of the negative process that allowed for any number of copies to be made. But the unique nature of the daguerreotype was one of the reasons why it was very expensive. So in 1839, Louis Daguerre, he named the process after himself, which is um, that his, well, that's you know, what he decided to do. So the daguerreotype, we have a sample over here. So it was a direct positive image created without the use of a negative. They hadn't been invented yet. So basically, a thin sheet of copper would have been coated with silver and it would have been polished to a high, high shine to make yep. it reflective. And then the image would have been exposed onto it. And that captures the... the that image. captures wow. the image, okay. but only once. You can't make uh, copies from it like a negative. It just yep. is, that's the image and that's it. A lot of them are in quite elaborate cases, like this one here, you can see. So you can see there wow. the image. So you have to hold it sort of against the light. Yeah, to and explain, see, yeah, just to people yeah. listening to this, it's, it's almost like a hologram. You, it's almost like a hologram. When you look yes. at it, it kind of yeah. shifts. And, and do uh, you know who this is? We don't. This is on our catalogue as unknown man, which is helpful, but that's really all we can say. So, um, and do we have an idea when this was taken? This was actually taken by Antoine Claudette. He was a student of Louis Daguerre himself. Dating early photographs like this can be very difficult, but Nora has been able to narrow it down because of the background information about the photographer Antoine Claudet, the man who took the image. He moved to London and started up his own studio. The studio started off on the Strand in London, and then in 1851 he moved to Regent Street. And because this is the, the address on the outer cover, is the Strand. We know it's before 1851, so it's between 1841 and 1851 when he moved there. So we can tell that, it's, it's, okay. it's a, so in between that decade. That's but it's very can, much a photograph. It's like it has a detail. A exactly. We're not talking about, what, you know, you were talking about earlier about kind of sketching in yes, something. Yes, exactly. It's, it's an actual photograph. But the, the way to tell a daguerreotype is it'll be in this case, but it will be a re reflective like a mirror. The daguerreotype was replaced by something called the ambrotype in the 1850s. It was very similar in the grand scheme of things. It still only created one image that couldn't be copied. As we talked about the ambrotype, we also discussed the people involved in photography at this point. As you can imagine, given it was a pretty expensive pursuit, it was a rich person's game. Before Nora comes in, just to say there is an example of an ambrotype at number two in the show notes below if you want to check that out. So the daguerreotype began in, in 1839. It was in use up to the 1850s when a cheaper method was invented by, I only found out this recently, the, so the ambrotype that was invented by James Ambrose Cutting. So again, he named the process after himself. <laughs> again, you can see this is cased. You can see the nice etched case. This is uh, Robinson of Grafton Street. So it's always nice to have a, a Dublin or Irish connection. The daguerreotype was from London. We have, we have obviously daguerreotypes made in Ireland too, but uh, I didn't bring one up today. So you can see there, it isn't as shiny, the mirror effect yep. doesn't happen, you can see properly. Again, not much information about this, we just know that it's an older lady, shall we say. And these, this has been digitised, I think, so um, it can be, you can see this on the, on the catalogue, like a lot of our photographs. But you can't, you know, you can't see the, the proper case and all that, but that's always nice to see, especially with the, the Dublin and were these expensive to create at the time? Do we know? Like, they would have been expensive, okay. yes. They, so you'd they, only have the one potentially? Ex or? Yeah, I might only have the one or two, depending on how rich you were. So it, it would be great if we had you know, a family connection as to who is in each photograph, but we just don't. So some of these we have no provenance for. They just, they're here as part of our cased photograph collection, but they're not necessarily, they may be connected with one of our manuscript collections of a, an estate or a family, but we don't know that that information has been lost or it was never here in the first place. And today we're all used to taking photographs ourselves. Yeah, everyone has a, a camera phone, it seems, these days. Who's taking these? Are these being taken by experts, essentially, who come in and do it? Or could you have someone in the family who might be doing it? At this stage, it was mostly studios. So it was mostly experts, commercial photographers. So the, so the amateur photographers weren't really around until maybe I suppose the late 1840s, there was a few around, otherwise they had to be rich, they couldn't really, regular people wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been a, a hobby for you know, regular people to afford. We continued this thread following the emerging technology, but also discussing who were taking these images, and this brought up the fascinating subject. If there were cameras around since the 1830s, are there any images of the Great Hunger? 
Then came along the tin type, which was even cheaper to produce. So the tin type, confusingly not on tin, but usually on iron, so thin sheets of, of iron. Okay. So this came along in 1856. This was even cheaper to produce. See here. Oh. Again, it's a, a woman. Again, um, it's a woman. I just picked women yeah. because it's mostly men that we see. And in these early <laughs> decades of photography, so we're talking 1830s mm. into now we're into the 1850s. So we're assuming it's largely rich people are going to be in the photographs. Is there a gender divide? Like, is a male? Does it tend to be more men than women, or is it just a, a rich poor divide? It will mainly be a rich poor divide, I, I think. We often get uh, asked a lot, do we have any photographs of, you know, people suffering in the famine? Yeah. And, well, we don't. So basically, photography only became, you know, it was only, so if we think 1845, 1847, photography was only invented a few years beforehand. And yeah. if somebody did have access to a camera, they wouldn't have been, they would have been rich. They wouldn't have been going around taking pictures of poor people starving. Yeah. So that's why most of the imagery we have of the famine era is drawings and yeah. things, so, but that's why. We then moved on to photography as we understand it. Again, it's much older than I would have thought. The major development in this regard was the negative process using something called a wet plate, which allowed multiple prints of any one image to be created. However, taking a photograph back then, as you're about to hear, was torturously slow. You had to hold a pose for around 12 seconds. That's a lot longer than you might imagine. Basically, that, that, that began with the, the negative process. So that meant originally there were glass plates because plastic wasn't really used yet. So they would have been glass plates were put into a camera, which was basically just a box, a wooden box. The image would have been, so the, the glass plate would have been coated with a, a light sensitive substance. Then the image would have been exposed. It could have taken, you know, up to, you know, 10 or 12 seconds, which sounds, doesn't sound like a long time, but it is when you're trying to keep still. The glass plate would have been exposed and then closed up again. And then that, the, the earliest process, the, so the, the wet plate negatives, they were invented in 1851. So sort of that became, so although tin types existed around the same time, the, the wet plate negative, they took over because they could be copied from easily. They could make prints much easier than they could make copies from these. They couldn't really. They'd have to re-photograph a tin type again to have it yeah. copyable. But the negative yeah. can be copied again and again and again to make multiple prints of the same exact image over and over again. We went on to talk about what people were photographing in the early stages. While Nora went on to talk about amateurs, she explained how, from an early point, photography was used to promote Ireland and attract tourists. Used to promote Ireland as a tourist destination, so and enticing rich people to come and visit, you know, the lakes of Killarney, the Gap and Low, and Wicklow, all that. So there's lots and lots and lots of photographs of Ireland looking nice, mm. basically. Um, and then they would have been made into, into postcards to make people, you know, want to come here, to make people, when they were here, to send photographs back of their holidays to people all over the world. But again, th that was a studio, and then if there was interested Amateurs, they would have been taking. They wouldn't have been taking pictures of, you know, to entice tourists. They would have been taking pictures of their holidays if they could afford a holiday. Of uh, sometimes the servants or children playing. So I'm, I'm thinking mostly of the the Clonbrock collection. So Clonbrock House was in Hasgraw, Galway, and the so the Dillon family, especially Augusta Crofton Dillon. She was quite interested in photography. She had her own dark room built on the. On the estate, we see here a picture of her and her family outside it. Oh, it's so, pretty elaborate. This is not like yes, a, a it wooden isn't just box. A shed, it's a, a shed yeah. in the it in the back just to explain garden. to people it's a brick structure with a lovely kind of uh, porch built onto it. Now, the sense I was getting was that while someone like, say, Lady Augusta Dillon, who Nora mentioned, could build her own dark room, poor people obviously couldn't afford such luxuries. I asked Nora if the poor appeared in these early pictures at all. And from her answer, I got the sense that when they did, they had very little control over the image. They were almost like props. She mentions a picture of servants on the Clonbrock estate. I've linked that as number three in the show notes below. But Nora starts by explaining where working class people appeared in images in the early decades of photography. In, in some of our, um, you know, group shots or scenes of fairs and that, here's actually, here's some 
I suppose, working class people. So these are probably, we don't know for sure, probably servants on the Clonbrock estate. Mm. So you can see they look quite uncomfortable to be photographed. They're not looking at the camera. They're quite yeah. awkward looking. So they might even, they might even have wanted to, to pose for the photograph. But Lady Dylan said, oh, no, you must sit there and take your photograph. Again, we don't know. Now, as the decades wore on, photography became more and more affordable. And by the early 20th century, there were large numbers of photographic studios, not only in Dublin, but across the country, where you could go and have your picture taken. It was far cheaper than, say, buying your own equipment. So in Dublin alone, there would have been, maybe not hundreds, but at least uh, 20, 30 studios, so every corner of the studio. So they well, used to refer to the stretch from the northern end of O'Connell Street, Sackville Street, to uh, Stephen's Green as the photographer's mile because it was so many photographic studios. So Lawrence, there was Lauder Brothers that came, became Lafayette. That was, and it would there would have been quite um, an industry in you know getting your photograph taken, going to the studio. You can usually tell a studio photograph as opposed to one taken in the person's house because they will have similar props. So there's some here that I have. I'll talk about more about this photograph later, but you can see that this is definitely a studio. Yes. And yeah. the, the backdrop is... Painted. Is painted. Yeah. There's um, a thing to lean on. Sometimes in the... So the, the pool studio is, as well. It isn't all just based in Dublin. There was lots of studios all around the country. The pool studio was based in Waterford. That collection here is about 65,000 glass plates, but you can see here. So this would have been another studio backdrop. And then they gave her a nice chair to, to lean okay. against. And sometimes if you see other photographs in the same run, you'll be able to see that, oh yeah, that's the same chair, oh yeah, that's the same backdrop, oh, I see, a different yes. person. So yeah. Now it could, uh, but Poole also went out, Mr. Poole, he also went out to people's houses and took photographs of race meetings, of, you know, high fancy events, of openings of schools and uh, festivals and things like that as well. But the, the studio portraits are what people who want to see, because They've been catalogued. Uh, the person who commissioned the photograph will be on our catalogue and then people say, oh, that is my Aunt Mary from that particular address. Can I come in and see the photograph? And I said, yes, we can do that. So a lot of the like my ancestors are from Waterford, but unfortunately they never went to the pool studio okay. to get their photographs taken, which annoys me every day. But <laughs> From what you're saying, though, people are probably photographing special occasions. I think we, I, may, I guess this is more of a recent development, but we've photographed everyday life and that's probably the most common photograph is just some aspect of everyday life these even you've just you've, you've got a photograph here or a negative here of a woman who's but she's posing in a studio she's obviously i imagine quite well dressed for the occasion so are people are these life moments or life exactly. events they, like, they wouldn't have just been you know taking a picture of your dinner that happens to look nice like we do now like i do now it would have been so it would have been a big deal and I know we, we still do that we, we get you know wedding photographs photographs when you're your first communion or when you graduate from university that sort of thing you still get those photographs taken but also we're taking pictures of just every day looking at like, sitting on the bus looking out at the Liffey for example but in the early days there just wouldn't have been the, the they wouldn't have gone to the expense of just taking any old photographs it would have been thought put behind mostly of what, the, what they were taking as we discussed these studios, it struck me that the images taken there slightly distorted everyday life insofar as the studios had props and sets. So what we see in photographs from this period are not capturing people in their normal dress or how they lived on a day-to-day -day basis. And this brought up the whole issue of whether photographs are an accurate depiction of the past, which was a perfect segue into the whole topic of manipulation of pictures through the ages. Nora explains now what we call photoshopping has basically been around for well over a century. Even in our great-grandparents' time, normal people were altering their appearance in images by subtly editing pictures. Nora showed me one glass plate where a woman's figure had been altered. The glass plate has been altered to make the woman's waist seem slimmer than it was. Oh, is this, this part filled yeah. in here? Yeah, oh, the black Just explain to people... They've obviously, they've given the woman in the photograph a curve that doesn't exist. So she's probably, like the line from her shoulder to her hip is probably straight enough. Yes, and exactly. And they've inserted this curve just, and is that done just with like... Just with, just with pen or ink, yeah, you can see the, the mark there. Now this actually, this photograph has been digitised so we can see what the 
finished version look like that. Okay. To, to me, it looks like you can see here it looks quite crude, but sometimes the photoshopping can be done. The, the photoshopping can be done quite well. Yeah. And when you see the print version, it it isn't obvious that it has been altered and that she is skinny. Okay. What I'm wondering is who's driving this? Is it like I assume the person goes in and goes, I want to look better. I assume I assume so. So maybe this photograph was so this was would have been commissioned. Then she would have ordered a copy. She might have seen, oh no, I'm 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 looking too fat on that one, please slim it down. Or maybe the photographer himself said, Well, I'll just sketch in a yeah. bit there. We don't know. We we can't tell from from our records. But we can just assume that it was the lady herself that wanted herself to be skinny, but honestly we don't know. This 19th century equivalent of photoshopping, as we called it for simplicity's sake, led to other, slightly more bizarre images. So just one more version of Photoshop that you might want to look oh, at. Yeah. I found this yeah. while looking for something else, and it seems to us that this was a picture of a soldier here, and yeah. we think he may have been beside another soldier, but for some reason the other soldier has been scraped out and they've inserted a crudely drawn tree beside him where the other soldier used to be. Now, again, we have no idea why this was done. I don't think it was done for fun or maybe not any particular reason, but maybe he just was photographed with his friend. They had a falling out and he didn't want, he didn't want a photograph of him and his friend anymore, so they changed the friend into a tree. It's, it's quite hard to explain. And this hasn't been digitised on the, on the um, well, catalogue, so you can't see the proper, the, you know, the, the printed version. But it just, yeah, I, just, I found it while looking for something else and thought well, it was quite amusing. There are other kinds of manipulation in early photography as well. Some of the most famous 19th century photographs in Ireland of political events were evictions during the land war and the following decades. However, Noran now explains sometimes the photographer was sensationalising the event they were trying to depict. You can see a photograph, you can appreciate it, you can look at it and know more or less what it's about and what's happening. But unless you know the behind the scenes context of where it appeared, why it was taken and who took it, you can't really be sure that it's an accurate portrayal of what actually happened. I'm thinking of the um, the eviction photos. So a lot of the eviction photos- oh, from the 19th from century. From the 19th century. So the tickets were sold to go and view an eviction. And a lot of them can look quite violent. And I'm not saying that they weren't, but some of the photographs do look a bit staged. Okay. Um, and there's like, you can see hundreds of people, you know, around and about waiting for the police to come in. When I visited the archive, Nora had taken out a few albums of pictures that had been donated to the gallery. Something that struck me about some of the images was that they were poorly taken. Some were out of focus, others were off centre. And this highlighted an aspect of photography that's only changed until quite recently. Today, when you take a picture, you can see the outcome instantly, and if there's any mistakes, you can just take it again. However, until the digital camera, there was a long delay between taking the picture and seeing the image. This could be days or even weeks, and it led to varying levels of quality. As Nora reminded me of this process that we all knew right up until, I guess, around the year 2000, I was somewhat more forgiving of the earlier generations of photographers. Yes take the roll of film, you'd send it off to the chemist or wherever to yeah. get it developed and you'd be waiting for weeks for it to get it back and then you come back and it's all the photographs are wrong, you've cut people's heads off. I suppose it happened a lot more. Obviously, if the photographer is more skilled, more skilled yeah. they would, you know, that would happen less. But like for amateur photographs and even you know, for, for children getting their first camera, it would have been a lot more, a lot of trial and error and mostly error. Yeah. <laughs> now this led on to the digital camera to bring the story right up to the present. This has led to an explosion in the amount of photographs being taken. It's now estimated that more photographs are taken every single minute than in the entire 19th century. And that's all down to the digital camera. Although it too has its own history and it took a few decades for it to become available to the general public after the technology was first developed. For example, I would have maybe two or three photographs of my great great of my great-grandparents who were born in the 1870s. I'd have a couple of hundred of my grandparents, a couple of thousand of my niece and nephews, and it just, you know, on and on and on. So the, the digital camera is basically the, the start of all that. And people often now have multiple cameras just on their person at any one time yeah. with the mobile phone. But the first digital camera, I was doing some research, it was invented in 1975, which is a much longer ago than I thought. It was by the Kodak company. It weighed over three kilograms 
and each image was digitally recorded onto a cassette tape and it took 23 seconds to record each image. So you're almost going back in time to the original <laughs> exactly. photograph. Exactly. So um, it wasn't really until the, so that was just a, a prototype basically yeah. like made by the Kodak company. So, oh yeah, look what we can do. But obviously it wasn't practical. You weren't going to be carrying around a three kilogram thing and yeah. taking 23 photographs to take, you know, 23 seconds to take a photograph. So it was really the 1990s when the digital camera became more widely used. So it took a while for, you know, the technology to catch up with the idea. And then when the, when the camera phone, I was quite late getting my first camera phone. And now people, you know, take hundreds of photos a day, whereas, you know, back in the early photography years, it could have been maybe one, two a year. And it, ha it has made it difficult for archivists of the future. My colleagues in the digital collections, they've run a few pilots recently of, for born digital collections. And we would be well used in both in manuscripts and here taking in collections of paper documents, you know, paper maps, photographs, negatives, well used to that. But digital collecting is a lot more complex. Over the course of this interview, we have covered the history of photography over nearly 180 years. And to finish, I asked Nora what her favourite photograph from the millions of photos in the archive was. Initially, her answer surprised me. The image is one that is well known and captures the most famous Irish woman of the early 20th century, Maud Gaughan. It's linked at number four in the show notes below. However, while the image might be well known, Nora shares what is a fascinating backstory to it. One of my favourites, it's, so this isn't the original, it's this photograph of Maud Gaughan. This one here, I'm sure people, some people will know it. We have the glass plate and the corresponding print down in the basement here, which is where all our storage is. So she was uh, quite a tall lady for the time. She was six foot and the, the glass plate is life size. The glass plate is basically over six foot tall. So I've never seen it. It's been, it's been wrapped up for many, many years. It's, it's, it's in a crate. It's quite, it's, uh, it takes up a whole wall, basically. But they did make some copies of it, which is how we have it in here. It's part of our Yates exhibition, which is back on, on Kildare Street. Alfred Werner, he took the photograph. He was a, a member of the Photographic Society of Ireland. Basically, I think he just wanted to show off that it could be done. I'm not sure if he took any other photographs with this camera, which the camera, by the way, that took this photograph was the size of a room. If he didn't take any other photographs, I don't know why. He just, he, he just wanted to take a picture of Maud Gaughan, and I think he, maybe he picked her because she was tall. I have no idea. I want to thank Nora for taking the time to talk to me and sharing all those fascinating insights into photography. You can visit the National Photographic Archive at Meeting House Square in Temple Bar in Dublin. You can also peruse their online catalogue, which includes lots of the images we were talking about today. I have links to that in the show notes as well. And next week, we will return to the Middle Ages for a show on daily life. That's not to be missed. Until then, Sloan. <laughs> <laughs>